Well, good afternoon. <laughs> My name's Clive Wilson, and I'm currently one of the economics fellows here at Girton. And I'm also uh, a past student and colleague of Frank's. Uh, it's a real pleasure to invite so many people here today, and wonderful to see so many faces, uh, so many people I haven't seen in about 40 years. Um, and it's fantastic that people managed to, I know, realize that people have, some people have traveled really a great distance to be here, and it's a real tribute to Frank that so many have made it, uh, especially at the current times, which is not particularly conducive to social gatherings. Um, I also realized that a lot of people couldn't make it, and I'm hoping that some of those are with us virtually on our live stream, or perhaps are uh, watching a recording of this later on. And to all of you, also, a very warm welcome indeed. Um, there were many aspects of um, Frank's life and contributions that we wanted to, to cover today, far too many for the afternoon session that we have. But we're very excited with the programme we've got, and very grateful to all of those that have agreed to come and talk today. Many, many thanks. Um, I think it's fair to say that Frank was not a conventional Cambridge academic. Um, and in putting together the programme that we have today, we, we certainly wanted some of that to shine through in, in different ways. Particularly important for me, and I hope something that will come out in the, the, the round table later on, uh, we wanted to, to cover some of the impact that he'd had on, on those around him, especially uh, close colleagues and, and students. But we also were hoping that some of the, the seriousness and importance of Frank's intellectual ideas um, and achievements would also come out today, especially um, for those who maybe knew Frank more personally than, than academically. Before handing over to my first two wonderful contributors, I just wanted to give a very brief background that might serve as a, a context for, for later talks and, and give some of a feel for um, Frank's unconventionalness. Um, Frank came from a large uh, Derbyshire mining family, um, one of 11 children, and uh, he, um, his grandfather, I know, spent his life in a pit. Um, Frank, after though uh, passing 11 plus, went to um, grammar school, but left early to start work on a farm as a labourer. He then went to um, he went into did his military service uh, where he trained as a chef in the army. After which he then came out and got another labouring job, this time in a steel mill. And it was here that he first started engaging with further education, and he enrolled in an extramural course in Nottingham University, where he met, amongst others, Ken Coates, and was encouraged to apply to Ruskin College, Oxford, uh, which is the trade union college. From there, he came to Cambridge, King's, King's College, Cambridge, where initially, anyway, he read ar archeology span and anthropology. He lasted a year of that and changed to economics. <coughs> Uh, his postgraduate work, uh, he was a um, British Steel Research uh, Fellow um, for a while and then switched into the Department for Applied Economics, the DAE, uh, where he stayed until he retired. Um, Frank um, did many other things along the way, but he became one of the first male fellows in Girton in 1977. Uh, I'm still not completely sure that I've got to the bottom of how many other fellows that joined him that time. I'm guessing that, that, that I think there was three, <laughs> but I'm not sure. We can talk about that later. Um, but um, he, even in his college attachments, he, he, he broke the mould a little. Um, anyway, enough from me. Um, this first session, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Jill Rubri and Ken Coots, who will take up the story of Frank's uh, work and contributions, especially, I, I, I hope, in the early period of work in the DAE. Uh, Jill is currently 
uh, Professor of Comparative Employment Systems at Manchester Business School and the Director of the Work and Equalities Institute. Before that, she worked with Frank in the Department for Applied Economics for about 10 years, was founder of the Cambridge Labour Studies Group, amongst other things. Ken is uh, now a retired lecturer in the Economics Faculty in Cambridge and a fellow of Selwyn College, as well as a colleague of mine on the editorial board of the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Ken, of course, worked with Frank uh, for, in the Cambridge Economic Policy Group as part of the DAE for many years as well. Now, I think you're going to interact or iterate, but I'll pass you to Jill first. Okay. Thanks very much, and it's a great honour and privilege to be here. Um, Frank was a large presence in everything he did, and he was certainly a very large presence in my own life, um, particularly in the first two decades of my academic career. Uh, as Clive's already said, I left Cambridge uh, for Manchester, uh, in, actually in 1989, um, but I had by that time worked with Frank for 14 years, 13 of them in the DAE. And his ideas and his way of thinking about the world, theoretically and empirically, have influenced my work uh, oh, ever since. <laughs> um, in fact, at the Festschrift conference I organised for him in 2000, I did make the comment that it was difficult to disentangle you know, where, where Frank's ideas and my ideas came from. And he actually agreed with that, which was actually, I thought, quite surprising. I thought it was a bit of a challenging comment. Um, but I had to reread Frank's work again to develop the Cambridge Journal of Economics tribute article, which I'm pleased to see that you has now online and you have a copy of. Um, and I realized that we did have, uh, I was again struck by the similarities of our perspectives and our methodologies. Of course, we had our disagreements. I think many of people in the room here will have had disagreements with Frank. Um, who, who hasn't with that such a passionate researcher? Um, but I think some of those disagreements were productive. I think Frank's real understanding of the working class and his commitment to it, I hope, has influenced my work. I think a lot of our disagreements perhaps had some relationship to gender and social class. Um, and, you know, I, I did take issue about whether or not it was only the middle class women who were exploiting the nannies. Maybe the middle class men were also responsible. Um, but I think we found very common ground very early on in, in our um, case that we made for a national minimum wage, which would have the same rate for men and for women, which at that point was relatively new and unusual and probably wouldn't have happened without the Equal Pay Act in 1970. And Frank was really concerned uh, that uh, we should not have the spin hamlet system that he also associates with our current working tax credits, that we shouldn't have um, subsidised labour um, to undercut everybody else. And I was obviously concerned to get rid of the notion that women only needed pin money and didn't need to support themselves. So um, we came together very early on in this sort of argument for a national minimum wage, which I think is a sort of common theme. So what were these key traits of Frank's ways of thinking and methodologies that underpinned all his work? I think, first of all, it's essential to see Frank as a product of two main influences. The first being his experience as a member of the working class and his commitment to improving the conditions of the working class. And on the other hand, his education within the Cambridge School of Economics. Now, at first glance, these may appear strange bedfellows. Um, it's not clear that the key leaders of the Cambridge School of Economics were that concerned with, or indeed arguably sort of knowledgeable about, the conditions of the working class. But Frank rightly saw in heterodox economics in Cambridge a last bulwark against the encroachment of neoclassical economics on both the economics discipline, and just as importantly, public policy. This was his motivation for being one of the main instigators of and, and a founder editor of the Cambridge Journal of Economics, and for his lifetime commitment to that journal, which of course was recognized of recent years um, in his appointment as a patron of the journal. He had many heroes within the Cambridge School. I'll just mention a few, Joan Robinson, Luigi Passanetti, Michael Kolecki, and indeed Brian Redaway for his no-nonsense approach to empirical investigation. And he constantly came back to their work, and by doing so identified clear weaknesses. For example, he would argue that in the work of Keynes and Edith Straffer, there was a neglect of the working class and a shying away from the politics of distribution. 
In developing the tribute paper for Frank, it was clear there was a common methodological approach and framework underpinning all his work. First and foremost, this involved a rejection of the search for a mythical equilibrium. So I'm going to quote here uh, from Frank's um, Productive Systems paper. The central proposition is that economic, social and political forces combine to determine in determining how economies develop. And the result is a dynamic non-equilibrium process which can only be revealed by empirical investigation. There are and can be no universal, predetermined, true systems to which underlying economic forces are tending. A second common feature was his rejection of a grand theories or overarching ideological positions. His work was always informed, I would say, by Marx, but not in a th what I would call a theological sense. His two main critiques of, uh, of much orthodox Marxist contributions were first their too narrow focus on direct capital labour struggles, as would be evident, for example, in Harry Braverman's book in the 1970s, and without sufficient interest or recognition of how this also took place through processes of intra-capitalist com competition and intra-labour struggles. And the second problem with a lot of Marxist work for Frank was um, that they um, underestimated the extent that labor would and had been able to extract some of the surplus and convert it into rising living standards protected through the active development of dynamic social norms um, that the state and employers had to accommodate if they did not want, in Frank's words, to cause trade unions. In his deliberate parody of his own important work of on do trade unions cause inflation. This wider perspective that located struggles between capital and labor as much as within, uh, uh, as much within processes of capitalist competition as within processes of direct control of labor underpinned his interest in industrial structure, including industrial districts following the insights and interests of his great friend Sebastiano Brusco, alongside and in direct connection to his interest in labor markets and patterns of segmentation and disadvantage. In short, Frank believed in the integration of the study of industrial economics and labor economics, in contrast to the then evident trends in labor economics to focus solely on the individual characters of labor and encapsulated by that hated term human capital. So for Frank, his starting point for understanding the labor market was the divergent development between and within industries, as exemplified in his early comparative work on the steel industry in the US and the UK. To use the traditional language of economics, it was the so-called imperfections in the product markets that were primarily responsible for divisions in the labor market, in contrast to the neoclassical critique of trade unions as the creator of labor market insiders and outsiders. These principles were brought together in perhaps his most important work on productive systems, from which I've just quoted. This considers the tensions between the need for mutual cooperation between capital and labor and the pursuit of their clearly divergent interests to be the linchpin of the whole model. A model that could be applied to firms, industries, or even countries, and could thereby generate both virtuous and vicious circles of decline or growth in nation states, sectors, and firms, but never a path towards a stable predict predetermined equilibrium. In developing this approach, Frank saw institutions and social norms as key factors in the shaping of these productive systems, and in contrast to the focus on institutions as static leg legacies that inhibit change, Frank focused on their dynamic nature as institutions and social norms are constantly reshaped and reconstituted by the process of social and economic development. He was thus, I would argue, truly interdisciplinary in his worldview, regarding it as, in fact, axiomatic that the understanding of the economic system required insights from sociology, politics, psychology, history, and more, such that the main weaknesses of the Cambridge School of Economics to which he was deeply attached were the failures to address politics and to recognize the active role of the working class in the shaping of history. This worldview influenced his work in all four fields that were identified in the tribute paper, macroeconomics inflation, including distributional struggles, labor market segmentation, productive systems, and the role of labor law and collective struggles over the employment conditions. These fields are also related to periods of his life and specific collaborations with other researchers. 
Ken Coots is going to take up his work on macroeconomics and inflation um, when working in the Cambridge Economic Policy Group. And then I'll come back to talk about the Cambridge Labour Studies Group and the International Working Party on Labour Market Segmentation and, and his work on segmentation and productive systems. While later, Simon Deacon, I think, will be talking more about his work on labour law and industrial relations, along with um, Keith Ewing and John Hendy. So I'm going to turn to Ken now to, for the first stage of Frank's work in the Department of Applied Economics. OK, Jill, thank you very much. Um, I must have met Frank in 1971 or 1972 when I joined the Department of Applied Economics as a very junior research officer, having just graduated. I was appointed by Wynne Godley to work on a project on manufacturing price behaviour and to be a member of the nascent Cambridge Economic Policy Group, the CEPG. Roger Tarling was already a member and working on labour market issues. Frank was at that time part of the labour group headed by Professor Bert Turner, with Dudley Jackson and Laurie Handy as co-researchers. Um, Frank, um, Dudley Jackson and Turner co-authored the book, um, Do Trade Unions Cause Inflation, published in 1972. Perhaps the only thing, uh, thing Frank and I had in common was that though Glasgow born, I spent most of my childhood and adolescence in Derbyshire, where Frank was born. We both knew the county well. When funding for the Labour Group dried up, Wynne Godley and Francis Cripps asked Frank to become a member of the CEPG, which was probably in 1973. Frank's name first appears in a policy group assessment of the UK economy in early 1974, when he started working with Roger Tarling. I want to tell you a little of how the, the, the policy group worked. For much of the year, uh, the group worked on separate research projects. The group was entirely male. Uh, that's what it was like back then. Frank and Roger worked on labour issues, Barry Moore and John Rhodes on the regions, Terry Ward with Robert Neild on taxation and government spending, John Llewellyn on exports and imports, Paul Atkinson on monetary policy, Martin Featherston on the development of the policy group model, and I on industrial pricing. From about October until March each year, the group came together to produce reports on the prospects for the UK economy, taking a new approach to the assessment of macroeconomic policy. The prevailing approach was based on short-term forecasting, trying to assess the current state of demand in the economy and how that would develop over the next eight quarters. Advice on fiscal and monetary policy was based on trying to match forecast demand with estimated growth of the capacity of the economy so as to maintain a high level of employment, so-called demand management. The CEPG approach was different. It focused on medium-term developments based on an annual macroeconomic model supplemented with research on structural changes to the economy. The aim was not to smooth the business cycle, an almost impossible thing to do in practice, but to identify structural problems over a five-year or more horizon. The group's early work revealed that it was increasingly difficult to avoid a conflict between maintaining high employment and a sustainable balance of payments with the rest of the world by means of conventional policies such as devaluation of the currency. Much of post-war economic growth in the UK um, has been called stop-go because policy oscillated between expanding demand um, when unemployment rose, then reversing policy when the balance of payments deficits caused foreign currency reserves to deplete rapidly. It was very exciting working in the group. The first Cambridge Economic Policy Review 
was published in February 1975 and received considerable press and media coverage. A particularly controversial proposal was that the UK would need to impose some form of import controls, whether by tariffs or quotas, but in such a way that the total of imports was not reduced and was therefore non-discriminatory in macroeconomic terms. Um, Britain could maintain its imports but have a lower rate of unemployment than would otherwise be possible on a sustained basis. The group was well placed to examine structural problems, including the issue of wage and price inflation. When preparing a policy review, the team worked in subgroups and I mainly worked with Frank and Roger. They had developed a highly innovative approach to wage bargaining. Much of this is covered in the Cambridge Journal of Economics uh, tribute article, which you have, and I don't have time to go into details. It was based on the idea of the desire for a customary standard of living, which increased as the economy and productivity grew. One could think of it as a real wage target. Bargaining was for a money wage, um, but was compensatory in nature, that is, recovering the loss in real earnings caused by inflation subsequent to any wage settlement. This was in sharp contrast to the more conventional analysis that bargaining incorporated expectations about future inflation. Trade union membership covered a substantial part of the private sector labour force, in those days, and many settlements were nationally negotiated. Factors which cut the real wage, perhaps uh, taxation or a slowdown in productivity growth, would lead to a shortening of the interval between bargain settlements, leading to rising inflation. The March 1976 issue of the Policy Review is a, is a good example of the collaboration in writing articles for the review about aspects of the economy. There were in that issue two articles jointly authored by Frank, Roger and me. One was on wage behaviour and the other on price setting. The research fed uh, into our work on the macroeconomic model that underpinned the group's analysis of Britain's economic problems. I recall a dinner we had many years later uh, to celebrate Frank being made a patron of the Cambridge Journal of Economics, uh, of which he was a founding editor. I quipped that the wage paper was one of the finest papers I never wrote. <laughs> I'm sure my contribution to it was minimal, um, and that maybe I had more input to the pricing paper. The collaboration was a great experience for a young researcher in learning how to write academic papers. The group read each other's papers very carefully and made drafting suggestions contributing to the final version. Frank's range was remarkable. He knew a great deal about the institutional structure of the labour market and applied it in his research. As well as being very able at finding good data, taking account of various practical adjustments for it to be usable in his work, he was very well read. His theoretical knowledge of the classical works was much better than mine. I recall occasions at coffee breaks where Frank and Francis Cripps would discuss difficult abstract theory and then relate it to the applied research, which was the principle objective of the group. After the demise of the policy group, my main association with Frank was as one of the editors of the Cambridge Journal of Economics. In the early days of the journal, when it was chronically short of submitted papers, there would be episodes when the editors themselves wrote papers for the journal. <laughs> We were very hands-on, ruthlessly editing and re-editing both submitted work and those of other editors. Some things could anger Frank, but what I remember most, looking back on those days of working with him in the DAE, and then as an editor of the CJE, was his great good humour, 
He was quick to see the funny side of things and to laugh and joke spontaneously. I want to close my remarks with an excerpt that Roger has sent to us. Here's what Roger says. Frank was a great collaborator and I learned a lot about the lessons of political economy, history and the realities of life at the cutting edge of the world of work from him while developing our research. Together with Frank and Jill, we developed the International Labour Market Segmentation Group and this provided not only a great deal of pleasure through the annual conferences that took place throughout Europe, but also enabled a greater understanding of the role that local culture played in determining how productive systems actually played out in different countries. I am proud to have known and worked with Frank and to be associated with him through our joint work. The world of political economy has lost a real visionary. Hear, hear to that. Thanks. Thanks, um, thanks Ken. I'm now going to pick up my history of working with Frank. I actually first came across Frank as an undergraduate student in Cambridge between 70, I don't know which year, 1970, 1973. I do remember he was giving a lecture as part of the uh, course that um, Bert Turner was organising at the time. And in 1975, I returned uh, to Cambridge um, uh, and uh, to do a PhD. And against my better judgment, was allocated to Bert Turner for my first year. Some of you will know that he was um, a brilliant scholar, uh, but a, a less than supportive person, shall we say. Um, but I, last, I only lasted a couple of months instead of a full year and transferred to Frank as, in fact, his first PhD student. Both of us, therefore, refugees from Bert Turner. Um, <laughs> um, as a direct outcome of my first year of PhD studies into low-wage work in Britain, we were offered the, the opportunity of a bid for a project funded by the Department of Employment into the effects of the abolition of wages councils. These bodies set, um, sat, set minimum wages, wage rates in poorly organised sectors, and, which, and at that time, the trade unions in general, but not all of them, were campaigning, and mistakenly in our view, to abolish them. This was the start of a very productive relationship with the Department of Employment, involving a range of projects, uh, including issues of home working um, and gender pay uh, issues uh, in small firms. And these projects led, I, I think, primarily to the formation of the Cambridge Labour Studies Group. This is what brought the Cambridge Labour Studies Group together, which was working alongside the Cambridge Economic Policy Group. They, weren't, they were sequential rather than, uh, they weren't sequential, they were um, contemporaneous. Um, at the time, this group consisted of Frank, Roger Tarling, myself and Christine Craig. And we continued working together as a group of four until Christine retired in the early 1980s. And over about a six-year period, um, we toured the length and breadth of um, the UK, visiting hundreds, literally hundreds, of mainly small firms in a wide range of sectors. I just mentioned a few, the jute industry in Dundee, the stamped and pressed metalwares industry in Birmingham, cutlery in Sheffield, baking in Liverpool, footwear in Northampton, the paper box industry in the southwest and Chesterfield, industrial and staff canteens across the whole country. Now these visits provided rich insights into productive systems in practice in all their diversity. And they also gave rise to many bizarre and amusing experiences, adding to the rich tapestry of life, you might say. I'll just mention a few. There was the time when Christine and, and Frank visited the baker in Eccles, who was making Eccles cakes for God. The, t the time when Frank was taken by taxi to the wrong address and found himself lost in one of the worst housing estates in Sheffield, surrounded by cut glass everywhere. And had to, the taxi had gone by the time he found his mistake, and they had to find his own way back, which was very difficult in the era of, uh, before mobile phones. And of course, the memorable exploration of the cutlery industry before its final demise, with many of the premises in such a dreadful state of repair that we had to con conduct interviews to the accompaniment of dripping roofs and requiring wearing of thick gloves in order to be able to warm enough to write notes. Now, Frank was in his element. 
exploring all these, um, the industrial processes and talking to people from all different areas and backgrounds about his favourite topic, work. You just had to be careful not to arrange too many interviews just after lunch, as Frank really liked a bit of a postprandial snooze. Uh, <laughs> This six-year period, I think, proved to be, have great significance for Frank's and my own academic orientations and priorities. 1977 marked the actual launch of the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Also, as we've already heard, it was a period in which he further developed his work on inflation and wage setting in conjunction with his great friend and collaborator, Roger Tarling, a topic which I discovered that Frank had been returning to throughout his working life, including post-retirement. And this was also the time of his election to a Girton Fellowship in 1977. And, he became, and this was the time when he then became much more closely involved with undergraduates than when I first met him. And the relationships he formed through this teaching, I know, proved to be extremely important to him throughout his life. However, it was also the period when, when separately or with his colleagues, he became engaged in three activities that would shape his work, I think, over the next decades. The first of all, the Wages Council project gave rise to our book entitled Labour Market Structure, Industrial Organisation and Low Pay. Not only was the title of this book very clearly linked to the productive systems approach that was set, um, that was, um, sorry, that I've already outlined, but it also made the case for a national minimum wage that should be set independently of government, given Frank's strong dislike of government income policies as came out in his work on inflation. And this was a cause which Frank continued to be associated with until his death, and which we'll hear more about in the next session. A second significant development was the founding of the International Working Party on labour market segmentation. This started off as a planned one-off conference on different theories of labour market segmentation. I think just two of that conference's attendees are here today, myself and Paula Vila. I, but I hope and believe others may be joining online. However, it was also, I think John Eatwell, who's in the audience, was, was also uh, influential in the original uh, idea that this should be a comparison of the Cambridge and US approaches to segmentation. Um, but the, the eventual funder of the conference, the Nuffield Foundation, asked for a more European perspective. And it was that twist to the, to the conference that undoubtedly was a major cause of the conference becoming a regular annual event. We've now held, held 40 in total. They've been paused during COVID, but I'm pleased to report there is a new expanded and increasingly useful steering committee being set up um, in this, and we were uh, planning to go back to a full conference in 2023. Now, from the perspective of 2022, international conferences and indeed detailed institutional comparative research is nothing new. But at that time, it was highly innovative, as recognised by the European Commission that actually funded us directly for a number of our conferences in the early years, as they sought to make sense of the different ways in which European labour markets um, functioned. I would say that the International Working Party was important to Frank's, for Frank's work in three main respects. First, it provided further support for his conviction of the importance of institutions in shaping productive systems and patterns of labour market segmentation. It helped the development of an approach to segmentation that was neither simply static and descriptive nor supply side oriented. And that was indicated by the first book from the conferences that Frank edited entitled The Dynamics of Labour Market Segmentation. And finally, it provided Frank with a wide range of new friends and collaborators. Here I would like to mention in particular um, Werner Sengenberger, a participant at the, at the first conference and with whom Frank continued to work after Werner moved um, to, uh, from Germany to the ILO. Sebastiana Brusco, with whom Frank formed a, very, formed a very close bond and whose innovative work on industrial districts in Italy informed Frank's interest in industrial districts throughout his career, despite Brosco's early death. And Peter Brosnan, with whom he continued to work on issues of minimum wages. Although Frank met Pete in Cambridge when he was visiting on sabbatical, Pete's continued involvement in the working party uh, after his return to um, New Zealand and then Australia allowed Frank to keep their friendship and collaboration alive. 
The third outcome of this very active period, I would say between 1977 and 1983, was Frank's development of his theoretical framework and published in the Joan Robinson Memorial edition of the Cambridge Journal of Economics in 1983. However, it first sprung to life at an EU conference in France in 1981, when Frank became inspired to write down this framework. And he then went ahead to present it during the conference, where he was asked to be a discussant. He was the opposite of nervous at such events. Even though it was one of his first major European events that he had attended, it was the content that mattered to Frank, not the forum. And if he had developed new thinking, he would present it without concern for a polished presentation. No PowerPoint slides were present in these days. Um, the next six to seven years, um, the second half of my period in the DAE, um, were also productive, but I think were very much marred by the impact of the DAE review and other associated events on morale within the department. Although we as a group did not lose any major funding, the loss uh, of ESRC support for the Cambridge Economic Policy Group in the early 1980s prompted Roger to consider a change in career, and Christine retired. In 1985, however, we secured funding as part of the ESRC's Social Change and Economic Life Initiative, where we had to focus on Northampton, and there were five other areas of, of the UK that were to be looked at, um, and we appointed Brendan Birchall uh, as the main new researcher on the team. This project came in a somewhat different format uh, than our previous more qualitative projects, um, being based on mainly on surveys of individuals and households. But the, they also had an employer part of the project, brought in very much in recognition, I think, of the Cambridge Labour Studies Group work. Uh, and this involved both a telephone survey, but also more interview-based qualitative research. Frank took an interest in all parts of the project, but was mainly in active in the uh, employer's side. Uh, the negotiation of questionnaires across a team of 50 academics was something he was happy to delegate to others. Uh, <laughs> indeed, Frank was often keenest, it seemed, to work intensively on projects that were not necessarily those that were fully funding his salary. He was very keen on working for the CJE, on his Girton teaching, on campaigns and minimum wages, limiting shop opening hours, or saving the Corby Steelworks, and on considering the implications of all, this, all his empirical work for economic theory. In my view, that, it was, that having escaped from his life as a manual worker, Frank was not inclined to find himself at the beck and call of funding bodies or government departments, and I think he was able to almost entirely to escape the strictures of the, of the REF during his um, academic career. At the same time, and this was really, he really recognized that and was appreciative of the fact that working in academia was a, was a very privileged position. The Skelly project still worked in large part due to the skills of, of Brendan, who's sitting in the audience somewhere, both quanti his quantitative skills, obviously, because the rest of us rather lacked them, but also his strong interpersonal skills and the high regard in which Brendan was held by Frank. And as many of you know, they went on after I left to undertake many interesting projects together, to, in particularly one on job security with, uh, for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, led by Brendan. It was also during this period that Frank was offered a visiting professorship at Notre Dame in Indiana. And he therefore spent several months away from Cambridge each year for a number of years. This proved to be a very important experience, I think, Frank, uh, for Frank, but both because he became a very close friend of the chair of the department, Chuck Crapo, and his amazing wife, Mary, but also because he met and helped develop many young scholars, most notably Sue Konzerman, who subsequently came to Cambridge and then to Birkbeck, with whom he was very active, he had a very active and productive research collaboration right up until a short time before his death. With Sue, he pursued both his interests in productive systems and critiquing public policy uh, both under New Labour and subsequent Conservative administrations. I was fortunate enough um, to spend four months in Notre Dame myself on a visiting associate professorship in the year before I left Cambridge, and thus could appreciate both the reasons for his close friendships and also witness the morale boost that this appointment gave him, allowing him to forget for a while the deeply insulting as well as worrying four-year review of the DAE 
that was explicitly designed to close the department down. This brings me to my last point, and that is to remember the energy and vigour with which Frank sought to defend the DAE during this period. This has all been documented in a forthcoming book by Professor Ashwani Seth, which will be published in the near future, so I won't dwell on the details here. While the book will show how not only the battle, but also to some extent the war was fought and won by the other side, not necessarily by winning the arguments, but through tactics of attrition as much as anything else, um, in many respects, Frank was a survivor. He remained in the DAE and prospered until his retirement in around 2000. It was extremely fortunate that Alan Hughes won significant funding at the end of the 1980s for a research centre on small firms that later became the centre for business research, to which Frank contributed, again developing his work on productive systems in industrial districts. For me, with a much longer period of active work ahead of me, the risks of staying in Cambridge were too great, and I recognised it was time to leave. But I did not leave the influence of Frank behind, but carried it forward into my own research and the research centres and Lashley Research Institute that I formed in Manchester, and through my continuing work with the International Working Party. So I'm honoured to have had the opportunity to talk about his legacy here today. Thank you both ever so much. Um, it's wonderful for someone like me who knows parts of the story having all these gaps filled and linked. Um, I'm aware that uh, we're five minutes into the tea break and for a room full of people who haven't seen each other in about 30 years, tea breaks are very important indeed. Um, but I also am aware that we will have two more sessions which hopefully will have time for questions or comments at the end. But if there is any specific question or comment that somebody feels desperate to ask, then fire away. So I'm just Catherine, yes. That it was a male environment. Joan Robinson attended many of the uh, Cambridge Policy Group meetings and made quite opposite comments. So it wasn't totally male, I would think. <laughs> Um, maybe not totally. Um, I remember Joan much more often attending the journal meetings than the, the policy group meetings. Um, I'm not sure if there's much point going into the gender bias of the 1970s, but, <laughs> but it was definitely there. <laughs> okay, many thanks. Well, I think tea waits. Okay, I'm alive. Hello everyone, and uh, welcome back. So we, we will start now our second session entitled Frank's Insights and Legacy. So we have uh, three panels in this session and uh, five speakers. So the way we're gonna organize that, we're gonna start with um, Jane Humphreys, and then we go to Simon, and then uh, John, and then Keith. Okay, so, and then I introduce them as uh, we, um, we, we go along. But before we start, I would like to say a few words. So I, I am extremely happy to be here today and get to know some of you and, and hear more about Frank, who I, have, I didn't meet. So I, I do want to know more about him. So I joined Girton College in 2017, October 2017, and it took me a while to learn my way around here. So, and then start this networking and then eventually to meet uh, Frank. But uh, it wasn't until 2019, actually, when I started finding a way to meet him. And that was because um, Girton College mistress, Susan, who is here, we started wondering about something like a Girton, uh, you know, a tradition um, in economics at Girton. And if that was possible, if it existed. And as we started thinking about that, we thought, oh, Frank, we know, we have to meet him. And then we started that, uh, you know, trying to meet him to find out about this tradition because we were very curious about two Girtonians uh, and famous economists, John Robinson and Barbara Wooten, how they would come together in that tradition because they have different approaches, they have 
they had a very successful uh, path, but very different. So we want just to take a seat with Frank and try to gossip a little bit about <laughs> John Robinson and um, Barbara Wooten. Uh, and also I got even more curious when a co-author of mine, Daniela Gizzo, she was invited for PhD Viva in Brazil at the Fence. And uh, the PhD was about heterodox journals. And there, what she found out, let me see if I can have here, it was a very interesting finding that basically in that thesis, uh, the, the author was uh, so frank as the most productive author in the history of Cambridge Journal of Economics. So Frank sat in the center of this important co-authorship relation, and I think this probably goes back to Jill's and um, Kane's point regarding collaboration and the role of Frank in the journal. So you can see here you have Frank there in the middle, then Tony Lawson behind, you have Simon taking another side. So this is a very interesting finding. And for their thesis, what they're saying is that this PhD thesis showed that Frank is certainly a reference in the recent history of UK heterodoxy. So, so yeah, so then Danielle will join us to try to meet a Frank to know more about that, but eventually the pandemic hit, you've never really uh, were able to meet him, unfortunately. So I'm really happy to be here, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. So thank you very much for being here today. Oops, here we go. So the first is, our first speaker is uh, Jane Humphreys. She's a centennial professor at the London School of Economics and the Emeritus Professor of Economic History at uh, Oxford University. So she joined us today to talk about Frank Wilkson and the past, his and others, other people's. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, no, I've gone green, so. Um, <laughs> well, I want to talk about three aspects of Frank's academic work, features um, that I think are also characteristic of my own research, so this is a little self-indulgent on my part, and I want to explore why Frank thought and wrote in these ways. Um, the first aspect involves perspective. How do we look at society? What perspective do we take? And here I have a little digression. When I was a little girl growing up in South Yorkshire in a coal mining community very like Ilkeston, which is where Frank was growing up, grew up, um, my weekly treat was a comic and um, the comic was called things like Girl or Girl's Crystal. And um, of course, I didn't really relate very well to the um, context and heroines of Girl's Crystal because they were called things like Gwendolyn and Jinx. Um, and they were invariably um, having fun at boarding schools in the south of England. Um, but I still enjoyed my comic. Uh, one section I really loved, which was about great women of the past. And um, I remember to this day very clearly the story of S Saint Perpetua, who was a young mother in Carthage who um, fell foul of the Roman Empire and was trying to crush out Christianity and she'd picked a very unfortunate time to convert to Christianity. And she wouldn't retract, so um, she was arrested and thrown to the animals in the arena um, with great aplomb. And I remember to this day the last two little squares in her comic strip story, which were where her slave girl, who was also thrown to the wild beasts in the arena, was asking, Will it hurt? <laughs> um, and Saint Perpetua said, no, 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 it will be a moment or two of pain and then a rising star to the heavens. And I couldn't stop worrying. What happened to the slave girl? Was she a Christian too? Had she converted her own free will? Why was she sent with Saint Perpetua to this dismal end? And it's this identification with, actually her name is Felicity and she was a saint as well, apparently. I now know a lot more than I did aged seven or eight. Um, but I told this story to Frank once and he laughed 
And he said yes. He had the same problem in school. He couldn't really you know, follow and understand why people took the, the, the perspectives they took. And he worried about people who were slightly off the stage, who were not there you know, in our vision of society. So, um, this is the point that I want to make. He found the subjects and issues addressed in school often far from his own particular perspective because he was looking at society and at the economy from below. He was interested in ordinary working people, and this guided his economic analyses, which, as the Tribute article notes, carried his conviction of the importance of understanding the actions and aspirations of the working class. Now, this perspective was not a comfortable one in academia, particularly not in economics, and particularly not in neoclassical economics. Um, but nor, as Frank argued, was it common within the heterodox economics of the 1980s and 90s. The Cambridge School, while challenging the core concepts of equilibrium, of market clearing, of the efficiency of, 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 of a market system, etc., nevertheless shied away from class analysis and distributional issues. Yet, as we have heard this, morning, this afternoon, these were key issues always addressed in Frank's work, whether he was thinking about labor market segmentation or productive systems or the evolution of labor law. To challenge in this way was not merely unusual. It was downright courageous. Moreover, it carried an obligation to be relevant and to contribute to ongoing policy debates that took time and effort, but which Frank relished. The second aspect of Frank's academic work that I want to draw attention to was his insistence that the economy, and particularly the labor market, could not be studied in isolation. Rather, economic, social, and political forces combined to determine how economies developed. And these developments could only be understood through detailed historical and empirical investigation. This insistence on economic change as involving the dynamic interaction of economic, social, and institutional factors is most clearly seen in Frank's long-standing work, extensive work, on, on productive systems. But I think it's also hugely important in the work with Simon Deakin on the evolution of labor law. Um, this is a book that I actually use in my own teaching um, in economic history. Um, also written from below with the experience of ordinary people, Saint Felicity, um, at its heart, Deakin and Wilkinson see labor law as endlessly trying to ensure the duty to work alongside social welfare and the labor market as operating within this tension. Inevitably, given this conceptualization, the labor market becomes structured by the social security system in place, by the poor law, by the benefit system, by all the subsidiary institutions that insist on the duty to work so that the relief for the indigent could only be conditional on deservingness and discipline. In the law of the labor market, Deaton and Wilkinson identify a range of institutions that collaborated in this dynamic interaction. Um, some of which are not usually understood in this way. For example, um, the um, COS, the, 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 um, um, uh, the Charity Organization Society, um, which went around and actually investigated whether claimants for poor relief were deserving or not. Um, and it's played a huge role in the crusade against outdoor relief um, and the, the uh, official poor law system actually delegated the iniquitous task of distinguishing the deserving poor to, uh, from the undeserving paupers um, to um, this institution. Importantly here, and again, this is a common characteristic of Frank's work, 
the family is seen as structuring and being structured by the dynamic interaction of the labour market and the welfare system. While orthodox and heterodox economists alike in the 1980s and the 1990s regarded the family as a black box standing outside the economy, Frank saw it as integral. In the law of the labour market, the family is regarded as a constituent institution, sometimes tasked with the provision of social welfare, offloaded from the poor law, and always charged with reinforcing through responsibilities, particularly those of breadwinning, the duty to work. The third aspect of Frank's legacy that I want to think about is his insistence that history matters. Indeed, it does not just matter, it is determining. An institution inherits a regime. A family remembers and acts accordingly. A community constructs a collective memory and takes this into its future. Again, this grounding of economic and social institutions in their history can be illustrated from much of Frank Wilkinson's writings. But it is, again, very important in the evolution of the law of contract and then the legal re requirements around the provision of poor relief. So the first two chapters then in the, in the book on, on the law of the labour market work in detail through the evolution of the law in historical detail and the legal requirements around the provision of poor relief. The work is magisterial and it's no story of linear progress. A transition from status to contract as historians superficially sometimes suggest. Instead, what we see is an inversion of the standard account for Simon and Frank together show from the long history of the English poor law, poor law right up to our own pursuit of flexibility, that it is precisely in those periods when a belief in the natural and self-regulating properties of the market is strongest, that the administration of social welfare is most repressive. And that's a key part of the book and a key part, I think, of, of Frank's legacy. So, as you will have learned from this afternoon, Frank Wilkinson was a rare scholar. His background was the key. His path to Cambridge and to an academic career was very unconventional. Indeed, he was perhaps a unique figure in the DAE and the faculty. A working class lad who left school early didn't have the right perspective. With the experience of physical labor and military service, he came into academia by a rare series of accidents combined with huge talent and serious drive. It was this personal path that ensured his work had the three hallmarks that I've talked about. His ancestry demanded that he take the perspective from below. His own experience required that he included the family as a significant institution, constituent of the labour market. His own history taught him that history matters. Frank never forgot his working class origins, and some might add that he never let anyone else forget them too. <laughs> they were kind of stamped on him, as well as on his writings. Um, my partner, Mike Best, has currently been working on um, the economists who delivered the productive system um, that guaranteed um, the West um, beat Hitler in World War II, defeated Nazism. And part of this has involved reading about Ernie Bevin. Um, so we've both just been reading um, 
uh, various biographies um, of Ernie Bevin. And in one of these biographies, there's an account of how Ernie Bevin, sorry, if people don't know who he is, it's, it's, it's not that important. But he was Minister of Production in World War II. But apparently he held his pen always like a chisel between his thumb and his first finger. And I suddenly remembered Frank Wilkinson's big hands holding a pen like a chisel. So this brings me to the image with which I want to conclude. The image of Frank working, writing in that large, confident, scrawling script on yellow foolscap at his desk. And the best I can do here as we bid him goodbye is to free ride on Seamus Heaney and adapt his famous poem to imagine how Frank embedded his past in his own research. So here we go. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound when the spade sinks into the gravelly ground. My old self digging, I look down. By God, the old man could handle a spade. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. You can substitute grandfather and coal here. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it and then fell straight to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging, digging. The cold smell of potato mould, the squelch and slap of sloggy peat, the curt cut of an edge, through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade now to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Thank you, Frank. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. That was a very enlightening, emotional talk. I hope these three hallmarks, perspective from below, family and history, is something that many economists right now can keep in their minds as they are doing their research uh, and looking to the future. So our next speaker is uh, Simon Dickin, who is a professor of law here at the University of Cambridge. So Simon join us uh, today to talk about Frank Wilkson, the Cambridge School, and the campaign for the living wage. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much, Carolina. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really moving to, to listen to Jane and think about my collaboration with Frank on the book, of course, but really other things as well. Um, my life and my career would not have been the same if I, if I hadn't met Frank, and he so decisively influenced um, really the pattern of my, my academic life, um, ever since from the first moment, I guess I really read his work with Jill um, on labour market structure uh, that she was explaining earlier. I was a PhD student doing my labour law thesis at Cambridge when I read about labour market segmentation theory and I knew that Frank and Jill were in Cambridge along with other people. I didn't know them personally and I was writing a research fellowship dissertation on this theme. Um, and that's how they got to know me and I got to know them. And I recall Jill writing me a very nice letter saying, would you like to go to a conference in Santiago de Compostela with the International Working Party on Labour Market Segmentation? I said, yes, please, I would really like to do that. <laughs> and that was 1985. And uh, shortly after my PhD supervisor, Brian Napier, was on leave, and Frank took over as supervisor. And I recall saying to the law faculty, I'm sure that's not allowed. Is it? They said, absolutely. Brian said, Frank can be your supervisor, even though he's not a lawyer. Right, OK. So in those days, it was, I think, a little bit easier. It's not impossible now, but it was easier, I think, to do interdisciplinary work. And we have to remember how critically important the Department of Applied Economics was to that. It was an amazing institution. Um, maybe law was only one small part of it, but within the DAE and indeed the Faculty of, Faculty of Economics and Politics, of course, at that point, you'd find a whole range of social sciences. You would, you would find obviously mainly economists, but also sociologists and political scientists and lawyers, yes, and historians, all sorts. 
And the idea of a, a Department of Applied Economics that was a research institute is also, I think, important. It was a, a bit of a head of its time in that, in that sense. Today we have, of course, research grants which are much more, I guess, diffusely uh, spread over the whole country. But in those days, big national level research units like the DAE, the Oxford Social Legal Studies Center, um, the, the Warwick Industrial Relations Research Unit. These were critical national bodies for training as well as for producing research. And the DAE played this absolutely critical part in the training I received even as a lawyer. So um, despite my legal background, I'm proud to be associated with the Cambridge School of Economics, if only through Frank and my collaboration with colleagues in the DAE and later the Centre for Business Research, including, of course, Alan Hughes and others. Both Frank and I were part of that institution, which still exists, by the way, and the CBR, in a sense, has been a legacy organisation of the DAE. Although the DAE no longer exists, which is a matter of enormous regret, there are many other legacy institutions, in addition to the CBR, which keep going this tradition of interdisciplinary and applied, empirically focused social science research. Jill has already said something about the methodology behind the work that she and Frank did on the wages councils in the 1980s and the notion of a, a kind of non-equilibrium understanding of the economy which informed that and the productive systems concept. So I don't need to repeat that. Um, what I would like to say something briefly about is the experience I had with Frank in the late 1980s of working on the campaign for the national minimum wage. Now, as many, as you, many of you will know, there is a national minimum wage in this country which dates from the new labour years, the National Minimum Wage Act um, 1998. But before that, in the late 1980s, Frank was leading, um, along with uh, trade unionists and others, a campaign for a minimum wage. It built, as Jill has explained, on the work that they did uh, the empirical work and academic work they did in the 1970s and 80s, this matured into a political campaign to get a, a national minimum wage for the UK. And this was both uh, an efficiency-related and an ethical case. So a distinctive feature of the Cambridge School of Economics was that it wasn't just a particular methodology, it, it was that and a particular way of seeing the world. But there was a very strong ethical component, I think, to the economics that Frank and Jill and others did and Ken did at that point this was economics for the real world. The GRACE, the university document that established the Department of Applied Economics in the 1940s, is absolutely explicit about the need for realism. The word reality is used constantly in this founding text of the DAE and in the early committee meetings of the department and what Keynes and others wrote about uh, for their vision of the uh, department. It was meant to be realistic economics, uh, there was a need for data to inform policy because there wasn't much data in the 1930s or 40s. The idea for the department goes back to the 1930s, in fact. Um, and it was public-facing. It was absolutely clear that it was meant to be advising government and informing public debate. Now, in 1988, um, Jill's already mentioned a paper that Frank wrote with Peter Brosnan, uh, a, national economic, a national minimum wage and economic efficiency in contributions to political economy. A really interesting and fascinating paper. I've recently been rereading it because I've just written an article for a labour law journal about the minimum wage campaign that we, we were both involved in. The uh, paper was written in collaboration, it seems, with uh, economists at the low pay unit who helped with the computer simulation. The low pay unit was a think tank at that point devoted to labour market and minimum wage research. And Frank also developed a relationship with Rodney Bickerstaff, a very important figure in the British trade union movement. He was the general secretary of NUPI, the union that later became Unison, which represented large numbers of low-paid workers. And the officials of NUPI had come to the view that collective bargaining wouldn't ever solve the problem of the minimum wage in the UK. Poverty pay required a flaw, a legal flaw, the solution was a legal flaw below collective bargaining, not replacing it, but providing a flaw of rights. Now, Bickerstaff's also a very interesting figure. I think he and Frank had a lot in common. Uh, much has been said about Frank's origins. Rodney Bickerstaff uh, uh, grew up in South Yorkshire in, um, uh, as part of a single-parent single household in a socialist and internationalist community. Uh, Frank went to Ruskin College, Oxford, and Bickerstaff went to Rutherford College, Newcastle. I think it became part of either Newcastle or Durham University in due course. Uh, Bickerstaff became a trade union leader, and like Frank, was very charismatic. They both had this charisma. It's very interesting. And at some point, Bickerstaff and Frank had the idea of setting up the Low Pay Forum, a kind of discussion group in which there would be academics, 
the think tank uh, people from the low pay unit and trade union activists and politicians. And we used to meet in the Houses of Parliament, no less, every month or so from about 1988. We'd go down and have meetings with uh, politicians and others. Now, Labour at that stage, the Labour Party was in opposition, um, and many shadow uh, cabinet ministers attended these meetings. Um, Frank didn't get on with everybody who came to the meeting. Right, OK, so I think... Uh, he had favourites and people were not so favourites. OK, so at that point, maybe, for example, Frank Field wasn't quite so favoured, I think, or Michael Meacher, but Claire Short was very much favoured. Right, OK, so you knew which side Frank was on. Um, so depending on which of them came along to the meeting, Frank would either give them a roasting or very much support what they had to say. This was, this was what it was like. OK, so it wasn't a free ride for the politicians, uh, but they all supported it. Brian Gould, Tony Blair. Now, Tony Blair at that point um, wasn't, I think, he was just an MP when we started, and then he became shadow employment spokesman. And at some point in the evolution of this process, we had produced a document called what, um, Why Britain Can't Afford Low Pay, Britain Can't Afford Low Pay, Why We Need a National Minimum Wage. And the Low Pay Unit published it, and it was a bit like a green paper, okay, with contributions from lawyers like me and Bob Simpson at the LSE, Frank and, uh, and economists, many economists contributed to it. Mark Minford, coincidentally, Patrick Minford's brother, we used to oh, laugh with Mark about this. And Alex Bryson, uh, now a senior economist in, in, in London University, then working for the low pay unit. So this green paper uh, was produced, and I was again rereading this the other day, despite contributing to it. I hadn't actually read it for well over 30 years, I guess. It's a very interesting document and lays out a systematic programme for a minimum wage of the kind we didn't actually get. Now, the, the minimum wage we did get uh, was a, a bit of a pared-down measure. What we had proposed was a minimum wage which would be tied to both wages and prices, and like the French minimum wage, which we used as a model, and here the influence of the Labour, international working party is quite significant, learning about French and German labour law, how it worked, and labour markets was important. But linking the minimum wage, not just to prices, but also to wages, trying to get to two-thirds of the median wage and uprating it on an a a annual basis, plus provision for arbitration, all sorts of things were in there, which didn't appear in the later new Labour version of the minimum wage. Now, I was deputed at some point in this process to go and see Tony Blair, and I'm not sure why it was me. But, right, I went to see Tony Blair in his office um, in, in Westminster. Andrew Hunter was the only aide he had at that point. And he gave me a good hearing, but he said, can you make it pay? Now, of course, thanks to Frank's training, I was able to say, yes, the minimum wage will pay for itself, especially at a fiscal level. And indeed, all the arguments that Michael Howard was then making in the House of Commons, the Conservative Minister, that the minimum wage would, would cost anywhere between 60,000, 600,000 and 2 million jobs was a completely bogus argument, which we had already refuted in the little green paper that, that the low pay unit published. Now, Tony Blair gave me a perfectly fair hearing, um, and New La Labour entered the 1992 election committed to a minimum wage at 50% of median earnings. Now, there's a complicated story behind why it wasn't higher than that, but there was a target set. It would move higher over the course of a parliament. I'm afraid the French Smeet model uh, got lost somewhere in translation between uh, the green paper we wrote and Labour's manifesto. But that's, that's how politics works. You can't get everything you want necessarily from that process. Now, we also learned that later because, of course, Labour lost that election. And after, we lost the, after Labour lost the election, um, I don't think Frank and I had any further contact. Frank may have done. I didn't with the formulation of minimum wage policy. And the National Minimum Wage Act was a very different measure. There was no uh, uprating mechanism, and the low-pay commission was set up to set a minimum wage very, very carefully calibrated to not cause unemployment, as they put it. It didn't have to be too high. Now, that was a sort of defeat, I think, for the Cambridge School. And in fact, it was LSE lawyers and economists who took up the baton. And the members of the low-pay commission were actually people who didn't really, I thought, believe in the minimum wage. I think that's a fair statement to make. Uh, now, um, people like David Metcalf had absolutely written um, against labour law and labour regulation in the 1980s. And I think my, 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 my former friend and colleague, Willie Brown, I think had a fairly sceptical view about wage regulation. I think that's fair to say. And Willie, of course, came from the, the Oxford Industrial Relations School, which was very much not the position of Bert Turner or Frank or Jill during the 1980s. So I think Willie had a, an ambivalent relationship to the idea of the minimum wage before he joined the Low Pay Commission. But I think he fully supported it once he became a member. 
remember. But of course, the low pay commission was doing a job that we didn't think was needed. We, we, we'd always argued for a higher minimum wage. Now, the, the moral of this story, Frank would say to me, it was very exciting for me as a PhD student to be able to go down to the House of Commons and meet people like that. And Frank said, um, fame is the spur. And I remember that he said, fame is the spur for you, Simon. And it's from John Milton's poem, Lycidas. Fame is a spur that the clear spirit doth raise to scorn delights and live laborious days. Right. <laughs> yes, Frank liked work. Okay, there's something in this. Well, fame, fame is a spur is also, uh, you may know, a novel and film in which a working class hero enters middle class life and it doesn't quite work out for him. <laughs> Right, so maybe Frank was sending me a message, although I don't come from a working class home. I did grow up in Derbyshire, and I do come from a mining family. My, my father was a mining engineer, and my brother a face worker. But like Frank, I can't claim to come from a, a working class home. I come from a middle class home, absolutely. Although, a Fabian one, yes. My grandparents were, were Fabian politicians in Manchester in the 1930s, and we always had a kind of Fabian I guess, atmosphere in our house. I don't think we ever watched uh, the Queen's speech when I was growing up, for example. So I didn't come from a working class home, but I certainly came from, there seems to be many connections to Derbyshire here this afternoon, from a Derbyshire home. Um, now, the motto of the minimum wage story is that it's not always uh, easy to get your academ academic ideas into law or into practice. In fact, it's fantastically difficult. And we did suffer a defeat, an intellectual defeat, in a way, in the 1990s and 2000s. People have spoken about the closure of the DAE, the eclipse of the Cambridge School by neoclassical um, economics, the rise of Chicago School law and economics over heterodox or institutional alternatives, and indeed new Labour's perhaps not very strong minimum wage was part of this process. Um, a few years after all this, though, one of my own students, Rhys James, helped to set up the uh, Living Wage Foundation in the UK and later went on to run it. And Rhys invited me to go down to a meeting in the House of Commons again. Actually, no, this was a Treasury. I went to the Treasury in the very early days of the coalition government. Now, Rhys said, uh, George Osborne was then the Chancellor, it was a Lib Dem Conservative coalition. He said, they're thinking seriously about the living wage being put into a statutory form. Now, the living wage, of course, today, we have a national living wage, but also the conventional living wage is something now that many, many employers implement. It is a real target, uh, well above the 50% median uh, that the Minimum Wage Act initially set. Cambridge colleges, universities, public sector bodies, even private sector bodies, uh, supply chains now observe the living wage set by the Living Wage Foundation. And it's proved a fantastic uh, success, I think. Although it would be better to have collective bargaining back to its original strength, the campaign for a living wage, again, isn't just a British campaign. I was surprised to go to, go to a meeting when a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer was in charge, where think tank experts and activists were talking about a living wage. But it was Osborne who introduced the national living wage in 2016. And I'll never forget this moment. It wasn't uh, announced in advance that he would do this. I was just listening to the radio. I said, George Osborne is introducing a living wage, um, shot, shot the low pay commission. In fact, Willie was very angry about it and said this was politics subverting the role of the commission. Osborne actually referred to the Speenum land wage subsidy argument, which Jill mentioned earlier in his speech uh, on that day. And what is striking is that the argument we had made against wage subsidization, that it was inefficient and costly, uh, was then taken up by a Conservative administration. Now, we still don't really have a national living wage. It's only an hourly rate. It should be a weekly rate or a monthly rate, as in France, to really work. And we have problems with precarious work as a consequence of this. But the lesson of this is that the work that Frank and others did in the 80s wasn't at all wasted. It's almost certain that there wouldn't have been a new Labour minimum wage, actually, in the 90s. And that was a compromise, and we understood that. And other people picked up the baton on that. Okay, David Metcalf, Willie Brown, other people picked up the baton with that. And that's fine, okay. We got a minimum wage of some sort, it was a compromise. But in the long run, the argument made in Cambridge in the 1980s has succeeded. It's convinced a Conservative government to enact something that's, again, only on the way to being a real national living wage, but not just them. Now, the final <coughs> anecdote I want to say uh, something about is a trip I made to South Africa in 2016 to take part in a conference there on labour law. And at that moment, there's a huge debate in South Africa, again, about having a national minimum wage and having a living wage. And the very same arguments Frank had been making in the 80s were being used there in favour <coughs> of a living wage. And um, I then realized that the living wage campaign had truly gone global. And this is the case. 
in America, in South Africa, in many other countries, in many mainland European countries, in Australia, even in China, these economic arguments that the Cambridge School made are being discussed and are being debated and are feeding into this debate. So my feeling is that the minimum wage work that we did uh, resulted in something tangible. Um, it is a very slow progress, uh, process to convince politicians and others of the case for progressive legal change. It's really difficult to do this. It's much easier to make the other case, to destroy things, to pull down institutions, to destroy collective bargaining, to pull it down, to have a so-called deregulated labour market, a naturalistic one, as Jane has explained, is also a very repressive one. It's so easy to destroy institutions and so hard to build them up again. And I would like to think that the work Frank did has borne fruit. And he would have been the first to recognise just how difficult and how slow a process that is, but how important it was to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very like, amazing and very vivid narrative account of the campaign for living wages. You indeed showed us this um, the difficulty, the, how the relationship between academia and practice is difficult, but also it made us uh, have hope regarding this long-term impact uh, that can happen and that Frank is part of that. So thank you very much for this. So we, we're moving to our uh, last panel which is uh, with uh, Lord Handy QC that's here. Uh, he is uh, the chair of the in Institute of Employment Rights, which uh, Frank has a, a very uh, strong relationship. And our next speaker uh, is Keith uh, uh, Ewing, who is a professor of public law at King's College London and the president of the Institute of Employment Rights. Thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, of course I feel very honoured to have been asked to come and speak at this uh, memorial event for F Frank. I first met Frank in 1989 in the Department of Applied Economics in Cambridge. I was there because I was keen to, or we were keen to establish what became the Institute of Employment Rights. It was a, a think tank for the labour movement and we thought of it as an antidote to the influential right-wing think tanks which floated ideas which were at the time extreme right-wing views which the Thatcher government subsequently asserted were mainstream or at the least on the right side of, uh, of, the, of the mainstream and therefore appropriate for the government to adopt or at least to influence other proposals from the uh, government. And we thought that a labour uh, movement think tank could dream up ideas on the left which might have not e e equivalent uh, force but at least some force in influencing the political agenda. I first put the proposition to Bill Wedderburn, Professor Lord Wedderburn at LSE, who was totally supportive and immediately suggested that I needed to speak to Frank. So that was why I made my way uh, to the Department of Applied uh, Economics and uh, we immediately uh, hit it off. He was full of enthusiasm for the, for the project, full of ideas and of course full of contacts of people that I needed to go and see, which I did. Subsequently, Frank became a key member of the Executive Committee of the Institute of Employment Rights and as we have heard, a very influential writer for it. His work with Simon uh, is really uh, timeless. Frank's strong belief that labour law was shaped by and had repercussions on the economic system, not ignoring the political, historical and cultural factors that Jane has identified, has been a fundamental characteristic of the output of the Institute of Employment Rights over the last 34 years and on its multitude of uh, authors over that uh, time. The law of the labour market that written with Simon is really the epitome of the idea behind it all. It was an analysis which lay also behind the trade unionist course 
which Frank established with the input of the Institute at Birkbeck over a number of years. Frank was very proud of the fact that the students were mostly work workplace representatives and many have since risen to leadership roles in various trade unions. Following perhaps in, in Frank's own footsteps. One of the things about Frank which struck me when I first met him and has on every occasion that I've ever heard him speak afterwards was his ability to communicate complex and radical ideas with simplicity and uh, elegance. Others this afternoon have spoken of Frank's intellect, his economic insights, but I'd like to add a couple of points. First of all, his quiet modesty about his, the huge talents that he brought to his, his work. And the Secondly, the fact that, as, and others have mentioned this, that he never forgot his roots in the Derbyshire mining community, he never forgot his politics, and he never forgot his class. He was always accessible to talk and give wise counsel on economics, politics, history, uh, or the development of the Institute of Employment Rights. And Carolyn Jones, our director for over 30 years, who apologises or asked me to convey her apologies to you this afternoon for being unable to be here, wanted me particularly to mention how she appreciated his support and his willingness to work for the Institute as an author, as a speaker and as an advisor on the phone. I and the Institute will deeply miss him. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> let me just pick up from uh, where John left off um, and to say again what a great pleasure it is for me to be here as well. Uh, I've known Frank uh, since 1977 when I was introduced to him by my uh, PhD supervisor. I can remember exactly where and when. It was in the Graduate Centre in the University of Cambridge down by the Mill Pond. So uh, I don't know how many years ago that is, but that's about what, 40, 45 years ago. And since then we lived, I mean, when I came back to Cambridge in 83, we had a house on each hard road. Frank at the time lived in Woodlark Road, so we were about 100 metres apart. So we got to know each other uh, quite well. Uh, we developed a friendship, a working relationship uh, we taught together on extramural uh, courses uh, and after he uh, retired and went to live in Over, I would uh, go on a Sunday night and we'd go out for a drink in the local pub until my cataract uh, became too, too, too bad that I couldn't drive anymore so we had to, to agree not to do that uh, uh, any, any longer. But we kept up uh, in different ways. But in terms of our professional uh, relationship, uh, as John said, um, uh, Frank was one of the founding members of the Institute, which had been established as a think tank uh, for the uh, labor movement. And actually it was Frank who, I'm not sure if John remembers this, but it was Frank who nominated me to serve on the executive committee at the foundation meeting in February 1989. And we used to drive up and down the M11 and spend uh, many hours together, as you do in a car with someone, it's very hard to maintain a silence in a long car journey. We, move, you know, we drive down to Eastbourne and various other places uh, to do some teaching or training with uh, shop stewards of the, then the Transport and General Workers uh, Union. So what, what did Frank uh, bring uh, to us? Uh, I think uh, he, along with Simon, uh, he brought a lot of uh, economic analysis and economic, uh, he provided, I think, the economic foundations uh, for the work of the Institute. And I'll come back and say something uh, about that uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, but he also brought a great sense of history and the great uh, knowledge, not just of economics, but also of the kind of historical context in which uh, labor regulation might uh, operate. And in one, I just wanted to give an example of one of the projects that uh, we worked on uh, together. Simon and John uh, were also involved in this. This was a fairly early stage 
in the uh, development of the organization. And again, it kind of post dates uh, Simon's work or, or, or with the low pay unit, Simon and Frank's work, low pay units. And it was on a project called Working Life. And this big book was uh, published, I think, in 1986. Um, it was a very ambitious project at the time, which involved uh, academics working with trade unionists. In total, there were 50 people on the team. Uh, we produced a report, I think, which was about 350 uh, pages. And I was looking at some of the reviews of this uh, book this morning before I came out. And one of the reviewers uh, reminded me that there were 222 recommendations uh, in this particular uh, volume, which uh, surprises me, me now. But in a sense, it was a, a sense of the challenge that we set ourself, ourselves and a sense of the problems that we felt uh, had to be overcome. But in a sense, I think there were probably three issues. And I think these resonate today. But the three, three central issues. One was the need for the universal coverage of labour standards. In a sense, everybody should be protected, and these standards should be effectively uh, enforced. Uh, and, you know, in the sense that this is relevant today because, you know, as Simon identified problems of precarious workers, problems of the gig economy, uh, and various other problems that we could, all, with which we'd all be familiar. Secondly, and I think this was uh, Frank's uh, great uh, influence. He wasn't interested just in legislation like the National Minimum Wage Act. I mean, that was important. But he felt it was very, very important uh, to strengthen what uh, we would regard, and I'm not sure if this would be uh, correct uh, language in economic, amongst ec economists, but for us it would be uh, the institutions of industrial relations. And we don't just mean, we're not just the voluntary institutions of trade unions and employers associations, but the institutions created or supported by the state through collective bargaining. And in particular, the steps that would be needed to reintroduce and to uh, re-encourage uh, the role of collective bargaining as a framework for setting norms uh, within the, uh, in the workplace. And here, a lot of emphasis, I think, was placed on, as a result of the concern of the deunionization that was going on at the time, uh, the uh, decline in collective bargaining coverage, and about how we could reverse this. And again, the answer, I mean, informed by Frank's great knowledge of history, uh, the, the, the importance of sector-wide uh, collective agreements, uh, and institutions like the ones we heard from Jill this morning, uh, such as wages councils, which I think we felt should be uh, reintroduced uh, in some form, but rebadged uh, to make them uh, more effective. And then the third point, which perhaps uh, was the lawyer's uh, contribution to this uh, project, was the need to ensure that uh, labour standards in this country uh, complied with uh, minimum international uh, legal uh, obligations, uh, which the Thatcher government uh, since 1979 uh, had violated uh, with the same casual indifference that Johnson is about to show to the uh, Northern Ireland uh, Protocol. It just didn't matter to them that we were breaching uh, international law, but in a sense we felt that it was important that we put an end uh, to that. So we produced this uh, big report, uh, as I say, with, it all, with all of its uh, 222 recommendations, and it would be fair to say that it got a mixed reception, uh, publicly and politically. And uh, I think we made it to the front page of some of the newspapers, uh, The Independent, I remember. We made it to the editorial columns of The Sun and The Daily Mail. Uh, I would say um, not favorably. Uh, we made it to the, uh, the, the news columns of Newsline, which I think was then the, the militant newspaper, not favorably. Uh, and we did have a nice, well, we had a report from Paul Routledge in the Independent on Sunday. And I may read to you, so this gives you a sense of what, what we were dealing with. So this is Paul Routledge, friendly, uh, pro, I think, pro-union journalist, previously at the time, subsequently the Mirror, but um, then working for the Independent on Sunday. So this, I'm gonna read to you a little bit from the, this, this report. So this was from September 96. So last Monday, old Labour revealed its ambitions in working life. 
a report from the Institute of Employment Rights, advocating, among other things, the re-legalising of secondary industrial action and tougher laws on unfair dismissal. The 350-page report was unveiled at a party in Congress House, where the warriors of the industrial Cold War, printers, mine workers, construction workers and firefighters, rubbed shoulders with Rodney Bickerstaff of Unison, the public sector union. If the devil should cast his net, a fine haul he'd have, murmured one observer. A TUC official looked in on this Jurassic Park and fled. David Blunkett, Shadow Employment Secretary, swiftly disowned the document. It would not, he said, form any part of Labour's political agenda. Not yet, they reply, sotto voce. Well, that was what we were up against. And um, that same week, uh, we were booked, Frank and I were booked to go on the BBC uh, Today programme to defend this. And uh, so he and I would go down to the BBC studio. I live in Cambridge, uh, still do, and we would go down together. I'd pick him up at about half past five, and we'd go down to the studio in Cambridge, uh, which, uh, which has moved. Well, where was it then? <laughs> anyway, so we, 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 we were booked in for that. Happily, Saddam Hussein decided to go on manoeuvres on the morning we were booked to give this, uh, this, this uh, interview, uh, this defence of a working life. And so they phoned me at half past five in the morning to cancel the interview. Never have I been more relieved in uh, all of my life. So I phoned Frank. Uh, he was ready, up and ready, fully dressed, ready to go. And I have to say that uh, Frank just loved this. I mean, he just loved being at the cutting edge of these uh, policy uh, debates. He felt vindicated by the criticism in a sense exactly in the sense that if these people are criticizing us for this reason, then we uh, must be right. And I have to say, he was a very calming influence in what was a very, very uh, difficult uh, week. And it's quite hard to be on the, you know, for some people this is a daily occurrence, I guess, but to be on the wrong end of this type of criticism uh, from these newspapers and we're constantly on the phone, it's quite, sometimes quite tough to, to deal with. But anyway, that, that's in a sense, you know, the, the, uh, hard to say, I think, what uh, impact or influence that had immediately. But, in a sense, Frank continued uh, to push this uh, line, or these, the sense of uh, the, the lines in this document, the different principles that we were seeking to develop, and the, the particular proposals that we were seeking to promote. And he joined us again in uh, 2002 when we produced the new charter uh, of workers' rights, this time with a foreword from the TUC General Secretary, so we were making progress. And then he joined us again in 2016 when we produced a manifesto for uh, labour law, uh, which uh, Frank was on the, the list of uh, contributors. And that, in fact, was uh, picked up, uh, endorsed by the Labour Party, albeit uh, under the last uh, political leadership of the party, though it has been endorsed uh, last year at party conference uh, under the uh, existing uh, leadership. So, but I mean, I, I don't know how long uh, A, the existing leadership will last, or B, uh, how long the commitment to this particular uh, project uh, will, will last. But at the moment, Welcome to Jurassic Park for <laughs> the existing leadership of the Labour Party. They're not just the Labour Party, now, of course, these ideas are now spreading, you know, as Simon said, in, in relation to uh, uh, minimum wage. You see throughout the world now, I mean, it's not because of our work or, or um, uh, necessarily the contribution that we made, but some of the ideas here are now mainstream. So it says the IMF. Uh, talking about, or the OECD at least, talking about uh, sectoral collective bargaining. European Commission talking about the importance of raising collective bargaining coverage and doing it principally through uh, sectoral uh, methods. Rebuilding uh, the institutions which have been destroyed, if you like, over the last uh, 30 uh, or uh, 40 years. I'm just looking at the clock. I just wanted to, um, I had a few points I wanted to make by way of uh, conclusion, but um, there are, I guess, I mean, let me just make a few points. I mean, the first of these, I think, um, I, I, yeah, one point I want to make was just to say, is to, 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 to say what we learned from Frank. Let me just try to personalize this a bit. What is it that we learned from him? 
So we were mainly a group of lawyers. So uh, it's, it's, we, people, you know, we, we work in silos, we don't speak, and we all do this, we don't speak to people from other disciplines uh, very much. But Frank was different. And I think what we, certainly what I, I'm not sure if this is what he taught us, but this is what I learned from him. And I think that's quite important. It's something that we need to realize also as teachers, uh, academics. And what we teach is not necessarily what is learned. But what I learned from, from Frank is a lot about the role of law and where law fits into the bigger picture of multiple disciplines, where, how it relates to economics, how it relates to politics, and how these three disciplines uh, fit together, politics, economics, and law. And maybe the point is quite trite, and maybe it's a, a point which uh, relates to the triteness of the legal uh, uh, discipline. But what I learned from Frank is that there's no point in seeking to develop uh, legal changes or promoting legal reform unless the economics are right. And we'll not, we won't get the economics. The economics will not be right unless the politics are clear. And for me, it was this kind of uh, trinity of disciplines which are very, very closely related. If you want better workers' rights, you've got to win the battle for economics. And in order to win the battle for economics, you've got to win the political battle. And that, for me, was a lesson I learned from him, which was very, very important. You've got to win the political battle, and from that, everything else will follow. But that is crucial uh, to uh, uh, the developments, if you like, of our type of uh, interest in workers' rights. And the last point I would make, second point by way of conclusion, last point I would make, is that Frank was absolutely right. And I think, I think, every, you know, I think of Frank a lot. And when the P&O dispute blew up earlier this year, I thought of Frank then. The P&O dispute was possible, or what happened at P&O was possible only because we made choices. People made political choices, they made economic choices, and they made legal choices, which enabled, and that not, not just in 1979, but in 1997 as well. And these choices enabled P&O to do what it did to the workers in question. And if we had a different model of the type which Frank had proposed, one which was committed to the universal coverage of labour rights, one which was based on sectoral standards for everyone who worked in the industry in question, one which respected international labour standards of the way that we had proposed with Frank's support in 1996, then p and would not have been possible. And in a sense, that is Frank's legacy, the legacy of enabling us to understand what is possible, what could have been done differently, and what could have been done better. What is possible in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, John and Keith, for this. And thank you for sharing with us uh, the role that uh, Frank had an Institute of Employment Rights, I think, well, I didn't know, obviously, but it's, it shows us this commitment that um, Frank had actually in changing the interviewing in reality with so many economists, actually, we want to, to do that, and it seems to me that Frank was doing that very well. Um, okay, so we have a little bit of time, or we're running out of time, but if there's any uh, question, like burning question, otherwise it just goes straight to the round table, because we're going to have time for questions at the end of the round table as well, right? So we can also hold your question to after that. Anything in comment? No? Okay, so Clive, thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. Thank you. I realize it's a, a, a quick turnaround, but I, I can hopefully tempt you all with the idea that if we start soon, we can finish soon, and then the drink session is next. Um, no, made no difference to anybody. Okay, fair enough. Um, that went down well. Um, just to say thanks again for the last session. I really enjoyed that one too. Again, uh, another session all about, for me anyway, making lots of linkages and filling in gaps. Um, I do think this session is probably something completely different, though. Um, the idea for the last session was really to just give some 
feel for the kind of huge impact I think Frank had on, on so many people around him, and especially his, his students. Uh, so we've assembled a collection of his ex-students. Each will talk very briefly, really, about the various things that, that Frank did or said that, that has influenced us. Um, the, I haven't given everybody like a set question that they have to answer. Uh, I, I did toy with the idea of making it the uh, what did Frank Wilkinson ever do for us session, but um, I thought better of it. Um, and instead, the idea really is just to create a bit of space, a bit of space to remember uh, things that seem important or, or, uh, 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 or relevant. I think we have a nice panel here of academic and non-academic contributors from Frank's time at Girton, raging, raging, ranging, <laughs> let's try ranging, um, ranging at least chronologically from Jill, who I think taught me statistics, to Maria, who I taught statistics to, I think it was statistics, maths, something, I don't know, one of them. Um, no, more formally, uh, to the left of me is, is Alan Falstead, who's a research professor at Cardiff University, uh, having previously been at Leicester University and Nuffield College, Oxford, before that. Uh, Maria Hudson is now in, based in the University of Essex. Um, before that was at the uh, Centre for Business Research in Cambridge, as well as, I think, along the way, the Policy Studies Institute in uh, University of Westminster. Uh, Nigel Pears is, is the next in line. Is currently at Mackinson Cowell, uh, specialising in advising companies on shareholder communication. And I hear is also chair of the policy committee of the Investor Relations Society. I think that's right. And also spent many years at uh, the Union Bank of Switzerland. Uh, finally, Jill, who I think takes the award for coming the longest distance, um, who's come all the way from Australia, is, is currently a member of the Australian Competition Tribunal having been an economist and commissioner at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Have I got that right? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, before we start, though, in the time-honoured tradition, I am going to abuse my position uh, as chair just to sneak in a couple of quick points, uh, which seem to me to be relevant in all of this. One is to highlight the fact that Frank was a great champion. He loved nothing better than to support people that he thought were worthy causes uh, and that other people often thought were lost causes, um, especially if they were one of his, um, and especially if they came from unconventional backgrounds. I, I mean, I certainly did very well at Frank's support at various and very important times in my life. Um, but it wasn't really the support that I, I wanted to draw attention to. It was his almost childish delight in, in hearing about his students' achievements or his accomplishments or that they did any, almost anything at all. And I, I honestly, in all the time that I knew him, he was never as happy as when he'd heard about the achievements of one or other of his students. Um, the second thing that I just wanted to highlight quickly was the, the kind of academic influence that he had on so many of us. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I'm alone in having mixed feelings about Frank's supervisions, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> He often went off topic, uh, seemed blissfully unaware of the, the topic that he'd actually set us, uh, and, and often seemed to be more kind of getting something off his chest in supervision. Um, I uh, see my students giggling at the back. Uh, I'm not sure what they would have thought of Frank's supervisions, but what I am sure of is that Frank was very much at his best when you went to him with a problem, when you went to him with a question, something that you wanted to answer. Um, I think some of us were all very lucky as a group that when we were here, Frank was living in Grange Cottage. And um, we, I think we're also quite lucky to be part of a group of fairly politically inquisitive characters uh, who found time somehow on top of our studies to have reading groups and discussion groups and whatever. And all sorts of things would be thrown up and we'd often troop out to Grange Cottage and knock on his door and sit down and ask him about stuff. And he was always fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. And he wouldn't like present us with, in answering questions, he wouldn't present us with a set of received theory. He would just get jump straight into how did it work? What was the process involved? And that was the, the kind of a message I think that um, 
certainly I took away, and, but continued. And I think for many of us, that role continues. Certainly when I was in the Center for Business Research many years later, I would just call in, especially at the end of the afternoon. He, he seemed to be happy with that. Knock on his door and sit down and just bring up a problem. And we chat. And I, you might not feel that you ever completely cracked the problem, but you always felt nearer to reality somehow. You felt that you had a feel for it all and how it worked. Um, Underlying up both points, I suppose, is, is the obvious, but I think the important point is that I, Frank cared. I think he cared um, deeply about his students. I think he cared deeply about how the economy actually worked, and he, did, he, he cared deeply about how the workings of the economy actually affected people's lives. Um, this caring didn't always make him an easy character to be with. Uh, as various people have mentioned, we've all fallen out with him at some point often over trivial things from uses of words to, to, to whatever. But this caring was absolutely integral to Frank, uh, and it was important to who he was, and I think it's, it's, it underlies uh, the reason why so many of us, I, feel, I think, still have such strong feelings for him. Anyway, uh, chair abuse over. Uh, Alan, all yours. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks. Oh, God, put this on, sorry. There, I've got a green. Uh, okay, uh, well, thanks a lot for inviting me uh, to, to speak at this event. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely already, and it's great to be back at Cam in Cambridge. It's, I rarely come back, actually, to Cambridge. Uh, it's, it's changed immeasurably. It really has. I mean, the tourists, gosh, you have to wade through them on King's Parade, and there are various things that I'm not uh, accustomed to at all. It's a very different world. But in a lot of respects, it's very, very similar. Very, a lot of it's the same. But I'd like to uh, offer some personal memories of uh, Frank Wilkinson as a teacher and mentor on me, uh, and that's Alan Felstead, who matriculated. Now, I haven't used that word in 40 years, uh, and I notice it's on the, in the program, matriculation. If I said that to the person in the street, and certainly in Cardiff, they'd say, was it painful? How'd the operation go? <laughs> Uh, matriculation, uh, I mean, the language, you mentioned before, uh, Clive, the language, the language of Cambridge is very different. Reading economics, we don't say that at, uh, at Cardiff at all. Uh, going down, going up, we certainly don't say that in that context. I don't know which way, anyway, don't go down there, Alan. But you get my drift. There's a language that's very Cambridge. I was, I matriculated, that started uh, for people in the street, in, in 1981. Uh, here's a photo of a, a motley crew, and this is why I've got PowerPoints, because I wanted to personalise it rather than actually uh, uh, say something abstract. A motley crew uh, stretching across three intake years. Uh, that's matriculation years. Uh, you know what that is, of course. Uh, 1980, 1981, and 1982. I was 1980, 81. And now, you may or may not spot yourself in this photo, or someone you know. I think, uh, John, John, uh, Jonathan, John Perriton, are you there? Jonathan Perriton, I don't think you're there. Uh, certainly Lester Hudson, you're there at the back there, I can see you. Um, but you may uh, recognize people, you may not. Uh, I'm actually there, the one with the moustache, right? Now, we've certainly changed, sorry, we've aged. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that we all had a couple of things in common. First, we had a keen interest in economics and a willingness to work hard. And secondly, we had a background which in normal circumstances we wouldn't have gone to Cambridge at all. These are the hallowed uh, halls that we wouldn't have set foot in as comprehensive school kids, most of us. Frank saw, uh, Frank saw that we all had a passionate interest in the subject. We were hard workers and we will, uh, he was willing to give comprehensive school kids, not public school ones, a chance. He practiced positive discrimination. Thank goodness we didn't apply to anywhere else. Uh, thank goodness, because I didn't, I didn't know uh, where to apply and when not to apply. You don't know that when you're a comprehensive school kid without the connection. But my fate, and I'm sure uh, for many of us on this panel, would not have been the same had it not been for Frank. So thank you, Frank. Uh, you saved our lives to some extent. You certainly changed them uh, to, for the better. What did we learn? Well, we were a radical bunch of 
Goethe and economists, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. We set up Goethe and left and went on many a march, including anti-Falklands War march through the streets of Cambridge. I remember that well. We got a lot of abuse on the streets, I have to say. We were regulars at all the major anti-Thatcherite marches and protests in London. Uh, we got season tickets for that one. <laughs> Encouraged by Frank, we set up our own Marx reading group, where we would read one chapter of Capital a week and meet in our rooms in Girton for discussion. With our radicalism came a keenness to resist. We must resist, we said. Uh, we were on the verge of boycotting the second year economics tripos. <laughs> Given its neoclassical focus, we did not want to do this. We weren't going to learn this. However, I vividly remember Frank coming to one of our Marx reading group meetings and persuading us to do the second year. His argument was, and it sticks with me today, you need to know your enemy. And I think that's a very good point. You need to know your enemy. And so we did. And just as I'm, that is me, by the way. I can't believe that's me. Uh, and also, that's Wolfson Court uh, that uh, I went there a few days ago. And I can't believe there's a sycamore tree in the, in the garden now. And you can't see the sycamore tree there. It's 40 years ago how things have changed. In addition to sharing his ideas through early sight of papers on wage determination, the influence of trade unions on the labour market, and the workings of wages councils, all about which we've heard quite a lot already, he was willing to share his resources. And can I also say, when he shared those, those uh, papers, they were called mimeographs. Remember those? People are laughing, the older people in the audience. They weren't called photocopies. They weren't PDFs. They were mimeographs, or mimeo. We, were, we felt honoured to see early sight of those papers, and we certainly were. The two graphics. At the top is the Joan Robinson Society, which Frank, Frank uh, promoted Gotonians to set up, I believe, in honour of Joan Robinson, of course. The society invited Cambridge economists working in the Cambridge tradition to give talks. We certainly had talks from Frank himself, uh, Jill Rubri, I, I believe, in the room down here, the corridor, Roger Moore, and maybe Jill Walker. I don't know whether you did or didn't uh, give a talk at that uh, that. Uh, uh, society. But in, in typical student fashion, we also held occasional celebrations and even discos, uh, raucous events, not really raucous events. On one occasion, I remember Frank was willing to lend David Brown, a fellow Gertonian, his Ford Capri, hence the Ford Capri here, to transport some paraphernalia from central Cambridge to Girton. That, by the way, isn't his Ford Capri, obviously, it's from Google. <laughs> Courtesy of Google, there we go. Remember in those, day, those days, a Ford Capri was a very cool car. Very cool car. Lent to a second year student. Now, wow, would I do that with my students? Would I? S no, I don't think I would. <laughs> would you lend your car to a second year student? But Frank had trust in us and was willing to share his tangible resources as well as his intellectual resources with others. I left Cambridge in 1984. I've not been back many times since then, I have to say, only occasionally. My PhD was not supervised by Frank, nor did I write with him, as others have done. Nevertheless, Frank's ideas have had a long-term impact on my thinking, albeit at a distance. Two examples serve to illustrate the point. Frank and Jill Rubri in the audience wrote a chapter on outworking, which linked the debates on the labor process to the location of work. This, of course, has echoes today with the coronavirus prompted growth in remote and hybrid working, which has challenged capital's control on where work can be carried out if required. It's not necessary to be within the site of management. It wasn't the only option. Frank's view has, has, was always that understanding processes need to be situated in a context, what he referred to as productive system. And this idea has been central to my work on understanding learning at work, and in particular what employers want employees to learn and what they don't want them to learn and why. The why question was, was always central in 
uh, Frank's thinking. But his greatest influence must be letting... letting oh, have I not done that? I've not gone through them, have I? Uh, but his greatest influence must be letting kids like me into a place like Cambridge. He also provided ongoing long-distance support and advice through references at my three post-doctoral posts. In fact, all of my jobs. So at Nuffield College, Oxford, he provided a reference at the University of Leicester and also at Cardiff University. His long-term influence has been to ground me in the tradition of the Cambridge, uh, as, a, as a Cambridge applied economist. So thank you, Frank. Yeah, thank you. And that was helped um, initially by Frank uh, providing me with an unconditional offer to study here at Girton. I think encountering Frank's work and that of the Cambridge School of Economics was a bit of a relief. So here was someone that engaged with the often harsh realities of working lives, and I could relate to what he had to say. The research that he was doing around labour market segmentation and low pay provided me with a, a framework for understanding issues that I felt were important. As a student, I found Frank very supportive, and um, I think, as you've already gathered from the others, um, uh, he was very approachable um, and welcoming. When I needed to do um, a maths um, exam as part of my preparation uh, for the uh, infamous uh, second, second year <laughs> prelims, um, he, he lined me up with um, Clive Lawson to provide support. And uh, for that um, uh, prelims year, also some extra support from um, Mike um, Landisman that was um, a bit painful at times, but also very much um, uh, appreciated helping me to, um, uh, to, to, to get through. And when I wanted to do a, a dissertation uh, for my final year on the Jamaican Sugar Worker Cooperative Experiment, he connected me with uh, John Wells as my uh, supervisor. I really enjoyed doing that um, uh, piece of research, helped by spending six weeks in Jamaica, out in the field some of the time in the summer of 1986. And when I decided uh, that I wanted to do postgraduate study in industrial relations at the University of Warwick, he supported my application along with uh, the late Willie Brown. Again, there was that sense of some, someone being very much on my side, being open to and recognising my potential, seeing my aspiration, and uh, I had a sense of just being encouraged. He was very encouraging. I was sorting through some papers recently and I found one of the essays I had written for my Labour Economics module at Warwick entitled, What Insights Does Segmentation Theory Provide for Policy Debates on Low Pay and Inequality? And just to read the first two sentences, I began, the 1985 low income figures showed 9.4 million people in Britain to be living on or below the poverty line. In addition to the rise in the numbers living in poverty, there has been a growth in the working poor and the numbers caught in the poverty trap. And I cited a paper by Brosnan and uh, uh, Wilkinson, work that's been uh, mentioned already today, writing on cheap um, labour, Britain's false economy. Reading through that essay after all this time clearly shows how much um, Frank and his colleagues uh, were, was imprinted on me as I made my way in the world. When I left Cambridge in 1987, it didn't cross my mind that I would go back. However, in the 1990s, when I was working at uh, Lancaster University, both Frank and uh, Willie Brown encouraged me to return to Cambridge to work at the ESRC Centre for Business Research. And I was undertaking um, separate um, projects with, with them, which was another vote of uh, confidence and uh, uh, encouragement. The project that I was working on with Frank and um, Brendan Birchall was funded um, by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation looking at issues around uh, job insecurity. So I was lo located in the Department of Applied Economics and I 
soon got into the swing of arriving to start uh, work in the DAE by 8 a.m., which was Frank's start time, including on Saturdays. <laughs> and he was always pleased to see me arriving at 8 a.m. on a Saturday. We often met for a chat first thing in the morning, sometimes discussing job insecurity, what, what it meant and uh, what the important issues were. He always listened very attentively to what I had to say. He often talked about what he was working on and reading, and I can remember him telling me about a book by William Ryan called Blaming the Victim. So Ryan was challenging some of the myths that we tell ourselves about race, poverty, and the poor. And that recognition of victim blaming and the bigger picture that surrounds it has really stayed with me. Frank often seemed to feel that it, his, was his, it was his duty to prepare me for the world by telling me that as I was a black woman from the East End of London, I would face uh, challenges, echoing his work on uh, segmentation theory and arguably um, uh, echoing some of the contemporary debates that we have around uh, intersectionality. I won't dwell on the challenges, but looking back over my career, I have, I've gone on to lead and co-lead a variety of research projects. I found myself very drawn to the Joseph Rowntree um, Foundation and its research streams engaging with social um, justice. And I jumped at the opportunities to undertake research for the Foundation's Immigration and Inclusion Programme, mm -hmm. its Brad Bradford Programme of Research, um, and more latterly, its um, Programme of Work around poverty and ethnicity, uh, trying to challenge myths and uh, bring to the fore structural inequalities and power relationships has been very much part of that work. When we parted, Frank would often say, keep your powder dry. Now, I sometimes say, keep your powder dry as a note to self. <laughs> So for me, that expression sums up Frank's sense of the need to strive for social and economic justice, and that while cooperation may be important, you need to keep a keen sense of the battle lines in striving for a more moral economy. And I remember a colleague once telling me that the real world isn't like in the textbooks, Maria, alluding to the politics of working life after I'd played ball with, I hadn't played ball with something. But I think for Frank, there was a real sense of him being earnest uh, and the words that he wrote really needing to mean something and really make a difference. And I think that we need more of that. And I try to work in a way that means <coughs> something and often think of Frank in doing so. Well, good, good evening, and um, like, I think like most people on this uh, panel, and indeed in the day to date, uh, I feel very honoured to be here uh, and have the opportunity to say a few words about Frank. Um, not the least because I'm at least a PhD short, I think, of the norm for this, uh, this session. Um, but my recollections, therefore, will necessarily draw upon my time as an undergraduate, from 1979 to 1982, when Frank in particular, but also Cambridge Economics, Girton, and the university had a very formative impact on my, my early years. I mean, as Clive has highlighted, um, my career subsequently went down the path of financial markets and corporate advice rather than economics per se. Um, but many of the analytical tools, the thought processes, and hopefully the values gathered then have stayed with me. So for my part, um, I first met Frank at an interview in late 1978. Uh, I'd taken the entrance exam fourth term, drawing upon a year of A-level economics, a few Sunday Times editorials, and I think writing probably some pretty questionable stuff. And also coming from a Midlands comprehensive school that had not sent anybody to Oxbridge in the previous ten, uh, five years, not ten years, it was quite daunting to walk through the door to be greeted by Frank and his co-interviewer, Dr. Sheila Smith. But though I immediately saw that Frank was serious and analytical, and of course very eminent in his field, I was also struck by the fact that he was humble, very affable and welcoming, and with apologies to anybody offended by this, some way removed from my stereotype 
of the Cambridge Don. In short, he was very normal and relatable to the eyes of a Leicester lad. And a bit of a confession here, Alan and I, having just, he, this destroys my earlier story, actually went to the same school. Two, I was two years ahead. Clearly two years in, in, in technological terms is, is a lot because I'm not doing PowerPoints. Anyway. <laughs> it, actually for a banker it's a Saturday and who, who wants a pitch book on a Saturday? Um, but I think the thing about Frank in the interview was it was obvious that he really wanted the applicant uh, to be able to give their best. Um, so I think he was also very acutely aware that not everyone arrived at the interview with the polish which some of their contemporaries had been schooled into. And he was very focused on a person's true substance and potential. So in, in that respect, and, and I hope the Gertonians, including the mistress, would totally agree with this, I think he was fully embracing the inclusiveness of Gerton's agenda, which was well ahead of its time. And of course, in my year, included admitting men as undergraduates for the first time. I think generally Frank was determined to ensure equality of opportunity in all its dimensions, uh, but it didn't always exist elsewhere in the Cambridge of that era, era. And I suspect he was therefore prepared, as Alan said, to practice a bit of positive discrimination when appropriate. I mean, I recall blundering around in the interview, but I think he forgave me the naivety of some of my views, and I was offered a place which for me was a life-changing event. In further support of this view of Frank and his kindness towards his students, uh, before the event I spoke with Sarah Hewin, also from the class of 1979, who's unfortunately unable to be here today, but she might be familiar to some in the audience because she's Standard Chartered's chief European economist and regularly appears in the media. And she said in her interview, Frank posed her a question, only to find that she had not covered it in the A-level syllabus, as she, she confessed. But it was, I think, probably typical of Frank that rather than marking her down for not having done the research, she said that he quickly switched to a topic where she could shine, where she was knowledgeable, and perhaps there a successful 40-year e economics uh, career began. And, and Sarah also fondly remembered uh, some work experience that Frank gave her immediately after graduation, picking up the theme that so many have talked about today, uh, supporting his research into the wage councils and the minimum wage. Anyway, thereafter, from meeting him in 78, I came up in 79 into what I found a magical environment in, in Cambridge and Girton in particular. And I had hugely fond memories of tutorials with Frank, especially in that first year when the Girton group gathered together for the political economy classes, and apologies to Jill because she did supervise me in a different subject and supervised me very well. Um, but it was, of course, as, as has already been said, the very early days of Mrs Thatcher's first term in government. The whole country was very politicised. It permeated economic debate, especially in Cambridge, which I think it's fair to say was not wholly receptive to the project. Um, so we had some impassioned debates amongst our group because, despite my earlier comments, Frank had admitted a cohort with a range of views. Um, and notwithstanding his own clear personal views and thoughts, I think he was very fair and channeled a broad discussion and was always insistent on the arguments, particularly in those big group sessions, being based on analysis and facts. I certainly remember being pulled up by him on occasion for being too long on rhetoric and not sufficiently grounded in the fundamentals. That said, it was undoubtedly helpful to my performance in Tripos 1 that he taught us well in political economy, and I believe he was both uh, a setter and one of the markers for the exam. So as the topic is Frank as an, inspire, as an inspiring teacher, perhaps I should just finally take a stab at what were those broad insights that I took away with me into a different subsequent career in the city. Admittedly, that career might not have been quite at the top of Frank's wish list for his students, but the training was undoubtedly very good. It's no, by no means an exhaust, exhaustive list, but I think the toolbox might include an empirical and analytical bias driven by a healthy scepticism, an understanding of the need to look beyond the nominal to find the real, that works in business as well as in economics, 
Um, a realization that alongside the analysis, one has to look at the politics of a situation and find the vested interests, uh, which I think also works in business and market situations as much as in political and economic decision taking. Uh, and perhaps also an awareness that everyone operates, businessmen, consumers, in an environment of uncertainty in our complex economy. And so confidence is an essential thing. And lastly, though maybe I learned this on the job in the last 40 years, financial markets can take difficult and turbulent routes on occasion. So finally, I think I'd say in testament to Frank, that another lesson would be to stick to your guns. Um, because that, what was once doubted or even derided can become the mainstream received norm. I think everyone much more expert than me has talked already today about the UK minimum wage. But the fact that became a bipartisan accepted good thing seems to me a fine example from, from his own work where he was clearly ahead of the curve, though I know there are debates about how uh, the specific measures we have got uh, work. So in that vein, maybe just one observation from the financial world, um, which is that I see, I do see, and I, I hear about p and um, but I do see in some of the more enlightened companies, a lot of enlightened companies, more engagement and commitment now from uh, the business sector across a broad number of areas, including areas like balancing stakeholder interests, corporate sustainability, and of course the existential topic of climate. I'm very happy to discuss those final perspectives later over dinner, and I don't doubt there'll be a healthy degree of scepticism in the room. But anyway, with an awareness as an eminent co-panelist to conclude next, um, and beyond that, a drink to toast, Frank, I'll, I'll hand over. Thank you. Thank you. And um, as others have said, uh, it's wonderful to be here today, and um, uh, I think Clive said I hold the record for having travelled <laughs> the longest distance to get here, and I only actually booked my flights about three weeks ago. It was very much um, uh, uh, an uncertain thing that I would get here, but um, when I read Clive's wonderful piece in the Girton Yearbook about Frank, I, that uh, led me to reach out to him and he told me that this event was being organised and wondered if I might be able to make it and this was um, some time ago now when the borders were still closed as you would know Australia and New Zealand have had their borders slammed shut for most of the last two years and so I like many had gone from I'd spent a decade of sort of going backwards and forwards to Europe to OECD meetings and um, and then spent two years not going anywhere, basically. So I think it probably tells you um, a lot that the first overseas trip I chose to make was to come here. And, um, you know, as I said, it was very much a, a last minute thing. Um, I wasn't sure that I would make it or, um, you know, be in a position to travel, but uh, I'm very glad that I did and I've really enjoyed listening to everybody so far. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Um, so I came to Girton in 1976 and I was actually the first person from my comprehensive school <laughs> to come to Oxford, Oxford or Cambridge. And I'd originally applied to King's because I, um, I actually had a very good uh, economics teacher at my school uh, who had encouraged me to apply and he thought you know King's was the trendy place to go and and uh, so I applied to King's and they didn't give me a place uh, but, um, uh, but John Wells at the time was just before um, Frank took over at Girton he was looking after uh, economics here and he plucked me out of the pool I think you still have the pool, and um, uh, and I think what what um, got me the interview was the fact that I'd written a, a long essay on Ricardo in the sixth form at school. <laughs> so um, so I came to my interview and and I got the place, and um, then. Um, 
Uh, by the time I got here, um, Frank had taken over as director of studies. And so I was one of the, uh, it, well, there was only three of us then, um, pleased to see that economics at Girton has expanded since then. So there was three of us in, in my year. And um, I had actually come, been admitted to do part one economics and then do part two law. Um, because I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, law was only a part two tripos at that time anyway. And um, uh, that was my original intention, but uh, pretty soon I decided that actually it was economics that was really my true love and I would uh, uh, stick it out and um, stay with economics in part two. And Frank was definitely a, a big influence in that decision. It's um, perhaps ironic that I've ended up spending much of my career working in the law, but I'm still glad I did economics because I think it's easier to pick up the law, I have to say, than the economics. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, Frank, as everybody has said, was a very, very supportive director of studies. He always had time for you um, and never seemed to, never wanted to hurry you out of the room. If you had anything to talk about, um, he was there to talk about it. He also organised for us to have the best supervisors for every subject. Um, and I'm immensely grateful for um, uh, everything he did for me as a director of studies. Um, he also was interested in us. Very, he was very caring, as others have said. And um, one of uh, an example of this is in my second year, I. Um, crashed my moped on the way back to uh, Girton and uh, uh, was in hospital for a week and he came and visited me in hospital and, um, <coughs> and then um, when I uh, got out of hospital initially I wasn't very mobile so he organised for me to have supervisions at 99 Girton Road. I don't know if it's still a college house but it was then and, um, uh, and in fact I can remember John coming and supervising me in, at 99 Girton Road. <laughs> Um, so, um, he was, as everybody has said, a very, very supportive and, and caring uh, director of studies. And um, uh, unsurprisingly, I think the, um, the fact that Frank did labour economics uh, influenced me to choose labour economics as one of my uh, specialist subjects and my, for my dissertation uh, in part two. He also encouraged me to write an essay for the Adam Smith Prize, um, which I don't think I would have known anything about <laughs> if, if he hadn't. Um, so I wrote the essay, not really thinking I stood a chance, but I, I won it jointly with Stephen Jones, who had been admitted to King's <laughs> and, um, and, um, and also does labour economics. And is uh, I looked him up, and of course he's... Uh, He's an academic in um, Canada these days. Um, and the other, the other um, specialist subject I did was, um, I don't know what it's called these days, I think it was called Advanced Economic Theory, and it was John Eatwell that influenced me to do that. Um, and um, so those were my areas of um, specialisation as, as an undergraduate. Um, and... Um, I knew by the end that I wanted to do my PhD in, in labour economics, but Frank and John both encouraged me to go off to the States and do a, a master's, and um, that's where I met Jane. <laughs> and um, uh, So I spent two years at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and uh, before coming back to do my PhD with Frank. And during those two years, Frank also... Um, gave me work in the, um, in the summer holidays working uh, in the DAE and uh, various people have uh, talked about the work on the wages councils and I remember that that was one of the things um, that I did some work on and I think that that experience was uh, a good one um, in terms of an introduction to the nitty gritty of gathering evidence that um, has stayed with me. So returning to Cambridge to do my PhD with Frank um, in 1981, 
Uh, unfortunately, at that time, there was this change in the funding arrangements for PhD students, which meant that the funding had to be attached to uh, bigger projects, and somehow the Department of Economics ended up with no funding. <laughs> so, um, so, undeterred, Frank somehow managed to wangle for me to do my PhD in the Department of Land Economy. And I was, did it in labour economics attached to a project on local government and Frank uh, supervised me from the economics department. Um, so at the end of that time, I then um, wasn't really sure what I was going to do with the rest of my life, but uh, saw this ad for a postdoc in Australia at the Australian National University and um, uh, uh, both um, Frank and Jeff Harcourt, who I'd got to know in the DAET room when I was doing those summer jobs, uh, wrote me some nice references and, uh, and off I went to Australia. And um, in those first two years, actually, um, one of the, as a postdoc uh, academic, and I did continue to work in labour economics during that time, and one of the things I actually worked on was um, home workers, which is something that's been mentioned. Um, but at the end of that two years, I sort of changed tack completely, essentially accidentally, I ended up switching uh, fields just because I, well, I, I didn't think that academia was really my thing after all and I needed a job and so basically ever since then I've ended up working in uh, competition law and economics and um, which is a very different field from the field that I worked in with Frank. Uh, I didn't even do the industry economics paper <laughs> uh, in part two um, though I do remember Alan Hughes who's been mentioned a couple of times giving a talk at Girton and thinking, why didn't I do industry economics? This is really interesting. And um, so I ended up teaching it to myself and um, teaching myself by teaching others. And I actually remember Jane Humphrey saying to me once, when I, I thought this was quite a revelation at the time, you know, if you've got a good grounding in economics, you can, you can teach yourself and teach others pretty much anything. <laughs> so I remembered that and... Um, so, uh, starting out in uh, competition law and economics, I um, took on a, a part-time job teaching industry economics at the University of Technology in Sydney in the evenings. And that's how I sort of learnt that area. Interestingly, I looked uh, the other day in sort of thinking about today, I pulled out my um, part two dissertation and um, which I don't think I'd looked at in about 40 years. And um, <laughs> in the conclusion, my first uh, critique of Braverman was that he didn't take proper account of product market competition in his analysis. So that was an interesting, uh, I'd completely forgotten that, I must say, that um, that was the area that I ended up working in. Um, I think the... Um, influence that uh, although I've ended up working in a very different field, I think Frank's influence has uh, pervaded me in a couple of ways. Firstly, I think he, he gave me um, a belief in myself that I could, I could adapt and I could find my way and, um, uh, and work at a high level and, uh, and that's, that's what I've done. Um, and secondly, I think his, his analytical approach to the world, uh, to uh, labour economics, has, has, has been, I've been applying it in the field of competition law and economics in terms of using economic frameworks to gather disparate evidence, whether it in terms of um, uh, documents, using documents and interviews and and data and pulling it all together um, to understand what is going on in the real world. Um, and that's, that's what I do, basically. That's what I've done for, you know, over three decades now, but in, in competition law and economics. And, and I realised listening to people um, talking as well about uh, 
the interdisciplinary aspect of Frank's approach and um, the work that he'd done with lawyers, that that's another uh, thing that has influenced me um, because I've, I, I guess I've become quite um, um, good at working with lawyers, I'd say. I mean, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but, um, you know, the work that I do on the tribunal, I'm sitting with the judge and we're working together and, you know, it's a very collaborative uh, um, approach to work that I really enjoy. Um, so, during, uh, I guess, in, in closing, Frank continued to take an interest um, in my work uh, in Australia and he visited me in Australia, I think it was about 15 years ago now. Um, and um, I've, one of my last memories of him is him uh, playing in my backyard with my two kids and um, taking childish delight, I think was the words that Clive used earlier, building um, little ramps and things for their, <laughs> for their vehicles. Um, and it's a lovely picture that I keep with me and I'm immensely grateful to Frank for all the um, support I had uh, in those early years and I think it really helped launch me for the rest of my career. Thank you. Thank you all. That was that was, that was lots of fun. Um, I'm slightly worried that I, all afternoon I've been saying there would be time at some point for comments <laughs> and questions, and there isn't any. Um, um, no, I'm sorry about that. I, I know that we are that we are already late for a session next door, and I can see there's people there. I, but I. I don't want to close down. Frank would hate it, the fact that people <laughs> wanted to ask questions and weren't allowed to. Um, so, very, very quick question, anyone. Would anyone like a very quick question? Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> they want a drink. Thanks, everyone, ever so much. Um, all the contributors. I, I really should have said an extra special thanks to, to Jill Rubri earlier, who kind of by accident became a de facto organiser, I think, at some point along the way. But her help in all this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, but thanks to everybody who's come uh, from wherever, even not Australia, um, to, to, to share what's been a lovely day. Thank you very much.